Superman and Lois, Season 1, Episode 1, titled Pilot. Okay, before I get into that, just as a totally off-the-subject thing, total aside, uh, I'd mention that according to a calendar published by DC Comics in 1972, today is the birth date of Toby Manning. Toby Manning is the real name of a supervillain called Terra Man, and he was one of Superman's longtime antagonists. First appeared in Superman Comics number 249 in March of 1972, and he has appeared intermittently and in various forms over the years. So my review of Superman and Lois for Season 1, Episode 1. So I always say, unlike most reviewers, I don't sit down and rehash the plot, pausing to say what I liked or I didn't like. You will find, and this is true of this one, you're going to get an in-depth review for the first time in quite a while because I haven't wanted to do one for Batwoman. It isn't worth my time. You're going to find far more depth than any other reviewer, and I will touch on everything that goes into making a film or a TV show. So we will just take it as read that if you've come to this video looking for a review, you have already watched Superman and Lois, Season 1, Episode 1, or you don't care that it's spoiled for you. However, for safety's sake, we should probably issue a... Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am a secret master of fandom, and that means that the fandom is strong with me. But this isn't a boast or a brag. This is just what happens when you have watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years' worth of science fiction. But the problem with secret masters of fandom is that we are cursed. We can't just see the new stuff without seeing the whole century that came before. And we sometimes find that it's very nothing is really original, and it sometimes interferes with our ability to enjoy things. One thing I do not do is outrage reviews. There are a lot of reviewers who are simply actors portraying outrage because outrage sells. They hate everything. Everything is a knee-jerk reflex because their viewers want to see them hate things. This causes a weird feedback loop between popular reviewers and um, fans where ultimately nobody likes anything. But I don't do that. If I like something, as I do with Superman and Lois, I will say why in detail. If I dislike it, I will tell you why in detail. But I don't do outrage because unlike other reviewers, I am the adult in this particular room. SuperGuru63 says, the best DC show since the first season of Arrow. Oh, God, yes. I cannot say enough good things about Superman and Lois. And the first thing I can say is, screw Batwoman. Oh, I hated that show. It was not worth my attention. I hated it. It wasn't even so bad that it was good. It was just bad in every possible respect. And thankfully, now I have a show that not only is good, at least the first episode, you know, they have a chance to screw it up, but this first episode was great, and I am never, ever, ever watching Batwoman ever again. Never. It was insulting my intelligence. It was a terrible show. I am never watching it again. I am so glad that I have something good to watch. I am kicking Batwoman off forever. I am never paying the slightest bit of attention to it ever again. You should not be watching Batwoman. It sucks. But you should be watching Superman and Lois. Good show. Worth watching. I give it a four out of five in general. And I would ordinar I might give it a 5 out of 5, except for some little nitpicky things. And trust me, most of what was bad in this was nitpicky. But I'll get to that. Always want to call out the great moments? Well, hell, with this show, the great moments are damned near everything. This is a really good show. <laughs> SuperGuru63 says, well, Stargirl's pretty damn too, but this looks very promising. Hope they don't screw it up. Yes, I'll be talking about that in a second too. Almost everything is really good with this. Um, there are some things that I'll talk about that I didn't like. Mostly they're nitpicky, however. But before I go on with this, I have to sort of repeat things that I said in my review of Superman 1978. I have a very long, very personal history with this character, and I believe that for the most part, maybe they've gotten it right finally, for the most part, I understand this character better than anyone writing him in any media, because we kind of have the same backstory. Not that I'm a super-powered alien from another planet, but the backstory of how we grew up is kind of similar. I was born in a fairly small town, not a small, a smallville, in uh, South Dakota. Um, well, I grew up in a city, like I do now, that at the same city I'm in now, that at the time was about 100,000 and 150,000 people. It's about tripled in size now. 
And uh, I spent summers on my grandparents' cattle ranch in very, very rural South Dakota. If you watch my video, A Trip to SYL Ranch, sort of, you can see just how rural it is. And frankly, uh, in the 1978 Superman movie, when you see this, which is uh, a shot near the Kent farm, it really, really, really reminded me of that ranch. Um, so I spent summers there anywhere from two weeks to a month from the age of 5 to 15. That place is now in my bones. Uh, I hope to retire there and, frankly, die there someday. Um, it is, this, this whole area is kind of in my bones. So I understand what living on a place like that is like, what it takes to actually run that, what it takes to live out there. And I've been associated with small towns. I have lived in towns as small as a thousand people, which is about like Smallville. So I understand how that small town life works. I um, went to Chicagoland and spent 10 years there. And Chicagoland, frankly, it's as close to Metropolis as anybody might get. You know, New York City is generally the stand-in for Metropolis. But hell, Chicago, you know, about the same. Spent about 10 years there. And then um, when, after my kids, when my kids were very small, uh, my ex and I moved to the Sioux City, North Sioux City, South Dakota. Um, that is part of a three-city area, North Sioux City, South Dakota, South Sioux City, Nebraska, and Sioux City, Iowa. They're just all at a conjunction of, of two rivers. And, uh, you know, different states, but conjunction of two rivers. And so I know what living in a small city is and the reason that we moved was because we kind of thought maybe this would be a better place to raise children than it would be in chicagoland and i think that was generally true didn't work out that way that we uh, we ended up doing that entirely uh, but that you know that i have that bit of life experience so we get to this show which is taking superman and giving him to teenage children and taking him out of Metropolis and moving him back to the farm. Wow. Another piece of this backstory that resonates with me personally. You know, here he's doing something that's very damn similar to what I did with my own children. I mean, they were much younger than that, but still. And, you know, the interesting thing about it, too, is you have to think about it from a, a, a reality perspective, too. If Superman's going to have children one of whom has superpowers, then you are not going to be able to hide a superpowered child in a big city. You just can't. <laughs> there are too many eyes. Not that many eyes out here. You know, my father said when Superman Returns came out, he said, well, I guess it's time for Lois to move to a farm. Because you're not going to be able, you know, that kid had, you know, was like eight years old, had superpowers. You're not going to be able to hide that. Not in a big city. You've got to go out somewhere that's remote so that he can do all these super things, but nobody will ever see him. So this thing really resonates with me on many, many levels, I, on that level that they've got him out now, going back to the farm because, you know, A, want to keep the, the farm for the family's sake, and that's a really good dynamic, but also the entire notion that you need to do that for raising the children there, I think, makes perfect sense it's again a bit of his backstory that they've added on here that he's never had before this has never appeared anywhere in comics or films or anywhere else but it still resonates with me personally because this is what i damn did it is it is fascinating to me it really resonates and that's one of the reasons i really really like it hey alexa glad to see you in here hope you saw um uh superman i mean and lois uh, first episode because i'm spoiling the hell out of it uh, Super Cruise, oh, you're getting, okay, I already talked about Super Cruise 63. But uh, closest to Metropolis, you live in St. Louis for a while. Definitely prefer small towns. Mm, yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. Um, I'm, I'm living in a relatively small city now, but again, when I when certain things happen personally, while South Dakota is in my immediate, uh, in my future, I think. So with this show, again, not only is it resonating with me personally, and not only is it making a lot, a lot, a lot of sense with regards to how you're going to raise a superpowered child. Uh, oh, you're not yet. You're working, oh, but don't mind the spoilers. Well, okay, because it's going to spoil. Um, I'm not really going to go through the plot. I never do that. Um, I am going to do what I've done on long form reviews, shortened a bit. Um, this is something that you would have seen in a long form review for me, way back when I was doing nothing but reviews. 
so show resonates with me i think it's well done period i think putting you know clark and lois and his kids into this position is really nice i think that's really really nice uh alexis says it was on the uh, fence about bothering to watch it but you inspired me to go check it out absolutely this is the best show that's come out on the cw period end of story because this is out i am ditching ever watching batwoman again Batwoman is insulting my intelligence. Always has been. So glad to be rid of it. I'm so glad to be able to review something on a weekly basis that's good for once. And they have screwed up Superman constantly. This is really the first time I've seen them do anything that really is like Superman. As you know, my backstory and all that tends to fall out. That I think is any damn good since 1978. You know, the current Superman stuff that they're doing is crap. You know, it's, it's it's taking Superman and trying to put him in the real world, which you can't do with superheroes. I've said about that a million times. So I hate that, but this is great. I think this is great. Supergroup 63 says, I grew up in San Diego and live in a small town. Um, at the moment, much prefer it. Yeah, I, I do as well. Yeah. So some Easter eggs. Oh, God, but there are Easter eggs in this. If you're going to watch, uh, you're going to see, you know, videos that do nothing but walk through the Easter eggs. But some of the ones that just jumped out at me because I'm a secret master of fandom. There are a million of them. <laughs> a number of them caught my eye. One of the first ones that caught my eye was in the Kent home uh, in Metropolis. There was a whiteboard that read, Call Dr. Donner. Well, this is a reference to Superman 1978 director Richard Donner. The same whiteboard said, call Siegel and Schuster. Well, this is a reference to Superman creators, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. That was amazing. Uh, Super Crew CC says, the guy who plays uh, Superman in the show does a great job. Yes, going to talk about that. Again, this is similar to a long forward review you might get. This is one of those ones that I could see going past three hours, this, this stream. Um... Another th another Easter egg where Superman froze a chunk of a lake or a, a river or something or other and then uh, ran over to the nuclear reactor with it, held it over and watched it melt. This is a callback to Superman 3 in which Superman did the same thing, only it was much more, much less, much less well ed executed. It was very poorly executed. Then there's this. Oh, God, did I love this. Just it's another callback, right? At the beginning... Uh, we're seeing one of the first things that Superman's doing around Metropolis. And we see him in this costume. This is an absolute direct um, homage to the uh, 1940s Fleischer Superman cartoons. If you haven't seen those cartoons, go and watch them. Your brain will love you for the rest of your life. They're awesome cartoons. I forgot to put a link to it. I will after the stream is done in my description box. Because there's lots of good copies on YouTube. Go and watch those. But I got a huge kick out of it. Because it is precisely the, you know, the, the costume that they've got him in. Exactly, you know. The S with the black background, the white, you know, uh, the white border, the trunks, everything. Exactly like the ones in the Fleischer cartoons. Huge kick out of that. Huge kick out of that. The S got you too. Yes, exactly. It was, it was great. It was great. Um, and then there was the exact uh, recreation of the cover of Action Comics number one. That was amazing. This, of course, is the cover, a cover of Action Comics number one, the very first appearance of Superman in June of 1938. And you can see he's holding up this car. In, in, in Action Comics, he's actually smashing the car. Here he's letting it down. But look, the angle's the same. The green car is the same. I mean, it's the same freaking color green. And it's got the same number of windows, which are broken out. And it's ah, just I, was, I, amazing. Just amazing. Secret Master of Phantom Time. Like, oh, God, that's astonishing. Uh, perfect. Great, great, great Easter egg. Now, I will say, again, Secret Master of Phantom, um, this show is actually a little bit derivative. Um, you know, in a, in a history as long as Superman, they've done a lot of stuff. One thing they once did was what they called a, uh, an, an imaginary story. Well, what that really meant was it was a story that took place outside the DC chronology, the actual in-universe stuff that they were doing. Uh, it was experimental. You know, it was what they eventually ended up calling like an Elseworlds. Doesn't happen inside the mainline DC continuity. 
Well, Superman and his wife, who, by the way, was always in darkness, because at that time in comics, there was a rivalry between Lois Lane and Lana Lang as to who would marry Superman. So his wife in this story is always in shadow. You never see who she is. Um, but they had two sons, one of whom did not have powers and had slightly lighter hair. And the other one had dark hair like Superman and had powers. Guess what? <laughs> This show has done the exact same thing. Now, this cover doesn't show the entire story. In the story, they get older, they're teenagers. And uh, because of the assumptions of the era, the superpowered one was the one that, you know, did all the heavy lifting and things. And the other one was non superpowered, got very brainy. And they did some stuff that was, in you know, had to do with continuity at the time that I won't bother you know, talking about. But they done it. <laughs> way back then uh, Alexa Chipman, Team Lana oh well yes if you're familiar with the uh, comics from that period uh, yeah I don't know who I was necessarily team for but uh, like I say the, the rivalry was ongoing at that time in mainline comics so they did not show her every single panel that Superman's wife is in you do not see her face she's in shadow in some kind Morgan Edge is in this uh, is mentioned here and he's, I'm sure he's going to come up more as a character Okay, if you've been watching that terrible um, Wonder Woman 1984, I think, isn't it, that Morgan Edge is in there or something? I don't remember. Such a terrible movie. Morgan Edge has a very long history in DC Comics. Um, he's evolved quite a lot since his original appearance. But in his original appearance, it was when Jack Kirby came over from Marvel. And... Uh, they said, well, what do you want to do, Jack? And he said, well, can I take over the Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen um, title? Now, until that time, Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen was basically, you know, one-off stories where Jimmy would get into trouble and do things like turn into a rubber blob or an alien or something stupid, you know, a porcupine, really dumb stuff. But then Jack Kirby took it over, and that's where he created the new gods that included Dark Side and all of those things that we think of now as the big bads of that universe. And Morgan Edge was initially a big part of it. Morgan Edge was initially one of Dark Side's minions on Earth. That changed over time. But what he did come in, as is in this show, he came in, bought the Daily Planet, he was running Galaxy Broadcasting System, Galaxy Communications, and <laughs> this was the really weird part. Because they were updating Superman at that time, they decided that when Morgan Edge bought the planet and he had this galaxy broadcasting system, he made Clark Kent an anchorman on television. And he was like that for a good 15 years. And he was no longer a, t a news reporter on a, he was no longer a reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper. He was actually a face that everybody saw every day looking out at them telling them the news. Okay. Uh, 10 out of 10 for updating the, uh, the, the, the mythos, but minus several million out of 10 for good thinking. Uh, because now you're dealing with a thing where people not only see Superman's face, but they see Clark Kent's all the time. And, um, you know, this just ain't going to cut it <laughs> anymore. <laughs> um, when they rebooted that in 1985, that was the first thing that went um, because they knew that that was kind of a dumb idea. But Morgan Edge did buy the planet. He did downsize. He did move Clark from being on the planet itself to a news anchor for WGBS in, in uh, Metropolis. Um, so I'm not entirely certain what we're seeing here in terms of Morgan Edge. Is he just uh, this horrible businessman that we saw him be from time to time? He eventually turned into kind of a curmudgeon. You know, kind of that rich guy running everything, and you would have to run stuff past him, and he'd be, I don't want to do that. No, it's going to cost money, blah, blah, blah. So I'm not sure which version of Morgan Edge we're going to see here, but there is the possibility, depending on what they do with this show, that he could bring in, usher in some level of dark side. That would be very interesting. Uh, Alexa, um, preferred, uh, preferred the older Superman comics, uh, skipped Wonder Woman in 1984. Uh, watch the pitch meeting. Or watch a reaction to the pitch meeting. The reactions are better um, because they'll react to it and they'll go, oh my God, that's exactly right. And by the way, all this happened too. It's a, oh, it's a terrible movie. Don't, certainly don't pay for it. Watch the pitch meeting. 
Um, anyway, uh, that's going on there. I, I don't know where it's going to lead, but I find the fact that Morgan Edge is involved and they're doing some of the stuff that they're doing in comics very interesting. Another thing that happened when uh, Morgan Edge came around, a guy named Steve Lombard came around, and he was the sports um, reporter for WGBS. Um, he was the usual sort of stereotypical jock jerk who was constantly trying to make Clark Kent look bad, which actually worked well for Clark because he would make him do things that turned out to be clumsy and stupid, and so it would help people think he wasn't Superman. Uh, but again, the whole point, the whole notion of putting Superman in front of everybody for the news for half an hour every day or more was kind of dumb. <laughs> um, one of the things they got rid of. Um, but preferring the older Superman comics, uh, the thing about it, too, for me, not only does my backstory mirror a lot of uh, Clark Kent's, I guess, backstory. When my grandparents, when I spent the summers that I did out at the ranch that looked very damn much like what you see in this picture, um, they had a uh, uh, an out room. It was actually an original log cabin from when the area was first uh, settled. But they, it was basically they turned it into a big storage area. Well, my uncles had been reading late Golden Age and through Silver Age comics when they grew up. And when they left home, they just left all the comics. So I got to read all of these freaking comics. Um, they're gone now. I, I wish I knew where they went because I'm sure now they'd be worth something on eBay. But my God, just comics after comics after comics that were the original published comics from the late Golden Age and, and into the Silver Age, well into the Silver Age. Got hooked on comics that way. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, the number of comics I've read, they have them all reprinted now in you know, bound volumes and stuff like that. But I got to read those kind of as if I was reading them as a brand new reader of that era. So, yeah, I, I prefer comics prior to, I, I, I mark the end of when I like DC Comics, really like it, with the departure of Julius Schwartz. And you may not know who he is, Alexa. Julius Schwartz is the counterpart of, of, uh, of um, uh, Stan Lee at DC Comics. What Stan Lee was doing at, uh, at uh, Marvel, Julius Schwartz was doing at DC at the same time. Um, he, he wasn't a showman like Stanley was, so his name was never really out there. But you can credit him for kicking off the Silver Age. He was the one that really kicked off the Silver Age in advance of Marvel doing what they did. And he was largely in control of much of DC Comics and certainly Superman as a character until he finally retired in 1985. And that's when they rebooted the, uh, the DC Universe for the first time. I don't know how many times they've done it now. But his thing as a as a boss was he knew when to say no. You know, so if somebody came to him and said, I want to do this with Superman, it's really radical and dumb. He would say, No, that's a stupid idea. Write me something else. You know, he, he would do that. Nobody at DC is doing that now. There's nobody there that says no to anybody. And as a consequence, I think that basically the comics tend to suck. I think art tends to thrive in some level of adversity. And uh, he provided a certain level of, of adversity that made some of the stories better. Alexa saying, uh, my uncle had some of those. Whenever I visited, I would vanish as a kid and be under the stairs reading them. Yep, absolutely. Um, I was so thrilled. It, it was so much fun to read those, you know, when you're not out doing something at a working ranch that looks a lot like this. Anyway, moving on, because this is going to be a longish review. Okay. Um... Had some cringe moments, which I'll talk about in detail more. Um, some of it had to do with character ages. We see Lois and Clark uh, supposedly aging through here, but no attempt is made to make them look any younger than, I mean, about their 40s, I guess, now is what they look like. Superman's costume, he's obviously wearing a muscle suit. That looks suckage. Um, God, why do you guys, why do you makeup guys just love stubble on men? Why do you do that? Superman Clark is constantly around with this black stubble. Why? That stupid Superman shaves. Period. End of story. Why are you doing that? Nuclear meltdowns do not happen the way that this was written. <laughs> and getting into writing, because I always do this, the writing was by Todd Helberg. His credits are he's active from 2016 to present. Primarily, he's a producer. He produced 15 episodes. He's uh, producing uh, 15 episodes, all 15 episodes of this first block that has been ordered uh, for Lois and Clark, Superman and uh, Lois. He's the showrunner for the series. He's also done 63 episodes of ex as executive producer in, as The Flash, 17 episodes uh, as writer for The Flash. 
And uh, this is the only episode for this season that he's credited on for a teleplay. Um, considering that he did other CW work, that's probably a good thing. Alexa saying, excellent points. Sometimes no is the right answer. Yeah, the inmates have been running the asylum at DC for 20 to 30 years now, and they have now created a universe that is so incoherent and full of internal contradictions. Basically, what's happened is anytime somebody takes on a new book, like Superman, they say, oh, I'm going to change everything so that it works the way I want to. And they just blow away the entire backstory that the previous person had been writing on. Then they get a new person, and they blow away what that guy did. And it's just getting ridiculous. Julius Schwartz would say, no, we have a coherent universe. You can't write stuff that's going to just rewrite things because you want to do it differently. Come up with a better story. Uh, story credits on this are also um, Todd uh, Helbing uh, and uh, Greg Berlanti. He has been active from 2000 to present. Oh, man, I always get on these shows. I, if you watch me review older movies and stuff, I, you know, you get people who are active for like 50 years. 20 years is pretty good. He is largely a producer. He has 66 uh, credits for TV series, including 25 episodes of Batwoman and uh, other Arrowverse shows. Um, he also, however, does Stargirl and Doom Patrol, which is a good thing. Uh, he has uh, six other projects announced, one in post and three in pre-production. He's got 26 writer credits. He's a creative developer of all of the Arrowverse shows, however, also Stargirl. Uh, he has a story screenplay <laughs> for the terrible um, Green Lantern film. And uh, so far, one story for uh, Superman and Lois isn't listed yet on IMD Free for anything else. He has won awards in 2018. He won the Black Real Television uh, Awards for Television Outstanding Drama Series for Black Lightning, which is one of the ones he's a creator and whatnot. On. In terms of the writing itself, I have to call out the nuclear meltdown. As always, writers don't understand what meltdowns are. Um, they are not because things get too hot and cause a nuclear fission explosion. Please, guys, Google, or better yet, go DuckDuckGo.com and look up nuclear meltdown for the details on the science of this. You got it wrong again. I do have to wonder, did it have to be Lex Luthor the first time out? I maybe would have saved him for later. Um, but that said... I didn't realize, I didn't realize looking at it, that it was Luthor until it was told to the audience at the end. But again, I probably would have saved that reveal for later in the series or maybe brought Luthor on as a villain much later. You know, I don't think you have to use him necessarily right out of it. Um, see you later, Alexa. Great to have you in here. Uh, Alexa has a, a channel on YouTube that I like very much where she does uh, reactions to movies and TV series. Great, great channel. I'll link to her when I get done here. Um, definitely go watch her stuff. I think she's very interesting. Not only does she have emotional reactions to some stuff, but she's very, very, very intelligent and will give you information you know, and talk about things much the way I tend to do, frankly. I am curious about this Luthor's backstory because it is not the Arrowverse Luthor. In fact, this whole series, near as I can tell, it has no relationship to the Arrowverse whatsoever. In the Arrowverse, the last time I looked, and I pay almost no attention to it, aside from reviewing Batwoman, which, thank God, I'm not going to do anymore. Um, but it's not the Arrowverse, Superman and Lois, even though they're played by the same actors. Because the last time I looked, I, and having to watch, it was Crisis on Infinite Earths. And Superman and Lois only had a single son named Jonathan, not twins. And in any case, this is 15 years later than that, if it was in that same timeline at all. And this is a totally different Luthor. And he doesn't, Clark doesn't even suspect this guy is Luthor, so I'm, and he doesn't have the same way of doing things. He's Captain Luthor for something. So I think there's some totally different backstory that's going to be thrown here. Um, but it is nice to have an air of mystery about this. I have to because of the people involved and all how they've all been doing, you know, Arrowverse shows, I, I cross my fingers that it doesn't go out that direction. But so far, um, you know, this episode was great. Um, I have to caution the writers about using too many modern cultural references. Um, using video games, showing them, that's going to date the show very rapidly. Using modern slang, for example, digits for phone number or just number, will date the show quickly. Modern slang will date it. Um, those things really only seem cool now. Five years from now, not so much. I must caution the writers about the locale. 
Um, don't dress people in so much flannel. I'll talk about that a little bit um, when I get to costumes. People in the rural areas dress basically almost exactly the same as in urban areas. Kansas, um, Kansas do not have a southern accent. Um, one character in here does have a bit of one. Kansas accent is very, very similar to the general American accent. It is similar to the accent, my natural accent, that I sometimes slip into when I'm not concentrating on trying to have a general American accent. It doesn't come uh, completely flowingly off the tongue uh, for me. Um, but uh, they don't have a southern accent. Um, if you need you know, help with that, please contact me for vocal coaching uh, and my contact form on SYLRanch.tv. Kansas, by the way, is not a dairy state, guys. Got to caution you. It's a plains state. Farmers and ranchers grow stuff like this and ranch cattle. Uh, the dairy barn that they show here is not even remotely accurate. Um, do an image search on Google or DuckDuckGo.com for modern dairy farms. You will discover they look absolutely nothing like that, uh, that barn. Modern agriculture uses dedicated heavy equipment and rarely, if ever, uses equipment that, is that it can fit in a barn and is attached to a tractor. Please uh, Google this, duck, duck, go it, or contact me at SYLRanch.tv for the details. They have, however, been very kind to us, those of us who live in areas that are rural or close to us. Please, please do continue doing this. I love you. Thank you very much. If you have any questions about how to keep doing that, please contact me on my contact form at SYLRanch.tv. I would appreciate it. This is just a totally different thing. People always talk about, oh, Superman is so overpowered. He's got this power. He's got that power. He's got that power. Um, that's true, but there is a way to resolve this that limits it down to actually one power that, uh, that impacts, that, that really explains all the others. And I take my cues on this from Dr. James Kakaklios, who has uh, done a book and has a video on YouTube called The Science of Superheroes. And it isn't where he poo-poos the science or anything like that. He says... Okay, let's give a superhero a one-time miracle exemption from the laws of nature. So the Flash can run super fast, even though that's impossible and all kinds of other stuff that scientifically would make that hard. Let's just assume that he has a one-time miracle exemption. And he does that for a lot of superheroes. But then, you know, I asked him at a convention. I actually said to him, what's, okay, if you're going to give a one-time ex exemption from laws of nature for Superman, what would that be? Because he's got so many powers. And he said, Somebody else, another physicist, but I, I, I found the article, had suggested that his one-time miracle exemption from the laws of nature is that Superman can control inertia. And if you think about it, that actually does solve all the problems with his uh, superpowers. Um, heat vision? Well, that's changing the inertia um, between his eyes and the target that he's shooting at. Um, super strength, that's just changing the inertia of whatever he's lifting. And in fact, that causes the problem of what, you know, if he's going to lift a boat or something like that, if he tries to lift it in real life from the front, it would just tear off the boat. But if you can change inertia, then it doesn't matter where you pick the boat up from. The inertia of the object has changed. Flying, well, that's just changing your inertia to go this, that, or the other direction. Super speed, you're changing your inertia. Everything that Superman does can be, can be boiled down to one superpower. He can actually just control inertia. I would love to see, I would love to see the guys uh, on this show uh, do that sometime. That would be kind of fun. Get into the acting of the show. Well, Superman Clark Kent is played by Taylor Hecklin. His uh, credits are 1998 to present as active. He has 37 credits for some for multiple episodes of TV series and recurring characters. He's done the other Arrowverse shows as Superman. How again, however, again, this show does not appear to be attached to the Arrowverse. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I guess they decided they had these two actors who seemed to get the characters, and they took them over for the show, but it doesn't actually connect to the Arrow Arrowverse at all. He has won awards in 2013. He won Best Cast Ensemble for Teen Wolf. Uh, for I'm sorry, what was the uh, actual award? Uh, the Young Hollywood Awards, because he's been around. He's not an old guy or anything. Uh, and in 2014, he won the Teen Choice Awards for Male Scene Stealer. His performance as Superman in, uh, in Clark is very good. I, I like it very much. Um, you know, we don't really get to see him acting, you know, kind of bumbling and stuff like Clark. And I don't think that there's any real reason to do that here. 
to be honest, there's no real reason, now that his kids know, there's no real reason for him to wear his glasses around that, uh, around that ratchet very much at all. Um, you know, you'd want to grab them when you had a visitor or something, uh, and you'd want to, you know, behave a little differently when you had a visitor. But when it's just the four of them around, why wear them? You know, so we don't see much of that bumbling stuff except at the very beginning. Thought that was good. He's a good uh, Superman in terms of, you know, he, he has a certain level of presence. He's not Christopher Reeve. Nobody ever will be. There's no way for anybody to top Chris Reeve's performance. There never will be. <laughs> Just done. But he's good at it. I, I like what he's doing with this role. Drop 2 says he can also control the inertia of what he's holding or the people or airplanes would disassemble. Yeah, exactly. If he picks up a boat in the middle of the boat, well, the torque forces are going to cause basically the boat to start coming down around him. But if he can control the inertia of what he's touching, then it doesn't matter. He can pick it up anywhere he wants by one hand. <laughs> the control of inertia should be Superman's one miracle exemption from the laws of nature that explains all of his powers. X-ray vision, heat vision, all of it should explain it all. Then we have Lois Lane, uh, played by Elizabeth Tulek. Uh, her credits, she, is act she was active 2011, tw sorry, 2001 to present. 36 acting credits, many for TV series with uh, recurring roles or as lead. She is Lois Lane in the Arrowverse shows. However, again, this show does not seem to have any connection to that. She did 124 episodes of the TV series Grimm, 15 episodes of the 2007, and this one was really interesting to me, of the 2000 web, service, web series Lonely Girl 15 as Aunt, uh, sorry, my um, makeshift... Uh, thing here school back on to alex now if you're not familiar with the lonely girl 15 show uh series that was very interesting and rather groundbreaking because at that time you know youtube was primarily being used for people who were vlogging you know a lot of teenage girls would come in and just talk about their day and stuff like doing this and doing that and i think you can still find it on youtube i'm not sure i haven't looked but lonely girl 15 was the first one where they had a girl who was acting she was not re she was playing a character she was not the person that she pretended to be but it was all very genuine looked totally normal and then it started taking a turn after a number of you know vlogs that she did it would take a turn and you wound up in an actual plot and it was for a long time it, there was a lot of controversy about is this woman real is what's happening in her life real because she's you know, the first stuff she put out was just, you know, average everyday vlog stuff. It was it was by a, a girl who had a level of charisma. But is this real? Is wait, is she is stuff happening? Because she's talking about abusive stuff. Is that is that happening in her real life? You know, and, and it wasn't until much later in the series that they kind of went, oh, OK, this is this is clearly just a web series. It's an experimental web series doing something that no one had ever done to that point. And it spawned a number of imitators um, trying to do the same thing. Uh, it, it, it was a fascinating series at the time. I remember it burned into my brain because of what they did. It was very cool. So she was involved in that. Uh, she's won no awards. Her performance as Lois is, is fine. I, I, I like it very much. It's going to be very interesting to see how uh, we juxtapose this person who has been a very uh, aggressive reporter and turn her into the wife of a farmer. That's going to be really interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about Superman's muscle suit. That that sucks. That's one of the things that sucks. I'm going to talk about that. Jonathan Kent, uh, the first of the twins, is played by Jordan uh, Elsass. His credits are active 2014 to present with 28 acting credits. He has one in post, one in pre-production. He did eight episodes of Panic and seven episodes of uh, Little Fires Everywhere has won no awards. I like his performance as uh, Jonathan Kent. Uh, he is the jock brother um, who is kind of jockey, but he's also very protective of his younger brother. Uh, they clearly have a good relationship. You know, they, he calls them names sometimes, but geez, you know, the number of times I called my sister names and didn't really mean it. They, they've got a good relationship and it works out. It's played well. I like what he's doing. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to like more of it as we go along. Uh, Jordan Kent is played by uh, the, the second son, the one who has superpowers eventually. He's played by Alex Garfin, who was active uh, 
Sorry, my makeshift uh, teleprompter got past it. Uh, from 2010 to present, he's done several episodes of various series. He was the voice of Linus in the 2015 The Peanut Movie, Peanuts Movie, rather. And this is his first uh, recur recurring supporting or slash lead role. He has won an award in 2016. He won the uh, Best Young Ensemble Cast Voice uh, Over Award for the Peanuts movie playing Linus. And again, I like his performance just good. Um, hits on a weird thing for me because, uh, as most of my longtime viewers know, I have a uh, problem with one of the reasons that it's, I can't work right now is I have a problem with a, um, a very severe anxiety disorder. I'm unclear that it's being played 100% true, but then I can only judge by my anxiety disorder, and I know there's a lot of different ways that that comes out. Um, I like the fact that, you know, he's sort of connecting with uh, that girl, uh, who I'll mention in a moment, um, in a way that is realistic to me. I hope she dumps her boyfriend for him. Um, but I, I like his performance as basically a child teenage actor. I think he's doing a good job. Again, he's got that relationship with his father. He is pissed off at his father. I mean, his brother, he's pissed off at his father, does that well, and it's organic, and I don't see him you know, struggling to do that. I think it's coming naturally, so good for him. Drop True says, these reviews of yours are detailed. Uh, reduce these down to 15-minute videos in your subscribers will build it, and they will come. Uh, this is the type of reviews I always used to do. Um, getting it down to 15 minutes is hard because of all the people I'm talking about. Uh, Kyle Cushing, the, uh, uh, the uh, wife of a, f um, a woman who is Lana Lang, uh, was Lana Lang, is played by Eric Valdez. He was active 2004 to present, has 19 acting credits, some for TV series with recurring or lead roles. He did 11 episodes of Graceland and 99 episodes of General Hospital. Hold the phone. When you're doing one of the things that actors will tell you is that doing a soap is a great way to learn because you're doing things very rapidly and every day you've got a new script and you have to be able to learn to act really have to learn if you're going to stay doing that they always say it's a great training ground so the way he's acting here is perfectly natural no problem with it at all uh and the way he's portrayed and and his objections to you know people leaving smallville hey perfect no problem. My only thing for about you is, dude, uh, Kansans do not have a southern accent. Their accent is very similar to the general American. You'll find me slipping into it sometimes. And contact me for voice, co voice coaching if you want to. Contact form at syolranch.tv. Marshall says, I'm just snoozing in the green room. Well, you know how it goes with these, Marshall. I, this is one that was so good, I just couldn't not do this. <laughs> Sarah Cushing, the uh, young pseudo-love interest, is played by uh, Indy Navarrete. She was active, God, I'm getting old, 2018 to present with seven acting credits. Um, some with multiple uh, or uh, for TV series with lead or recording uh, characters. Did 13 episodes of 13 Reasons Why and 10 episodes of Denton's Death uh, Date. No awards. Performance, good. Uh, again, no problem with these uh, younger actors. I think they're doing very good. Um, somebody who is confiding something very personal about herself to another guy who also has basically the same problem, bringing them together a bit. Um, I hope she dumps her boyfriend. I want to see her getting together with Jordan. Luthor is played by, I'm not sure how this pronunciation is. It wasn't in um, IMDb nor um, Wikipedia. I think it's Wally Parks. He was active 1999 to present. 35 acting credits, some with multiple or TV series with lead or recurring roles. Did 13 episodes of Devious Maids. He played Nate in uh, the 2019 short Virtuality. And 35 episodes of As the World Turns. So again, we have a guy who has been working, working, working. Uh, he has an award, 2019. He won Best... Uh, for Escape Velocity, he won the uh, Best Actor in uh, Virtuality, rather. Uh, performance is good for what we see. We don't really see him very much, so I'm sure we're going to see him more. I'll have more to say about him. Director of this episode was uh, T uh, Lee, to um, I'm sorry, Lee Toland Krieger. Or Krieger. He was active uh, 2006 to present. Again, I feel so old. 
2010 producer credits. He exec produced this episode of Supernatural Lois. He has done 20 episodes of You, 19 episodes of Chilling Adventure, uh, Adventures of Sabrina. And he's producer director for uh, December Ends in 2006. He has 17 director credits um, with uh, listing so far two episodes of Superman and Lois and four episodes of Rivendale, uh, something else. He's got a lot of other ones. And was the screenwriter for That Vicious Kid in 2009. He's won awards in 2006. He won the uh, Moder- Method Fest Best Picture Award for December Ends. And in 2009, he won the, uh, sorry, I can't see it past my freaking thing, the Denver International Film Festival uh, Best Screenplay Award for that uh, vicious kind. His direction here is good. Um, here's the thing about it. Uh, I w- was so generally interested in the story that I had a hard time really concentrating on the directing. What I can say is, it was definitely good. There was nothing in here that I looked at and said, oh, God, that's a terrible way to do that. Um, I think everything that he did was great. Uh, no problems here. Nothing that really jumped out at me as, wow, that was an amazing shot. But at the same time, nothing that said to me that this was just absolutely wrong. So I think he did a very good job. Director of photography is Gavin Struthers. His credits, he's been active Oh, gosh, from 1996 to present, 44 cinematography presents. Hey, he did an episode of Doctor Who, The Power of Three, which was the episode right before Amy and Rory left. He's done 11 episodes of Black Sails, 29 episodes of Holby City, and he has 12 camera and electrical department credits, no awards. Now, as I often say, the director's job is to say, I want to get this shot. And the uh, cinematographer's job is to say, here's how I'm going to do that shot. And in a really good movie like Superman in 1978, you have a working environment where the two of them are inspiring each other. You know, they're saying, well, I want this shot. And the cinematographer says, well, I can get that shot. But what if we tried it just a little bit differently? And they get something that's really wonderful. I don't know if that's going on here, but what I can say is cinematography was fine. I have no problems with the cinematography. Again, nothing that really jumped out at me. But again, you know, it was, it was good. Nothing, nothing had said to me it was bad either. Production designer, here we get into some stuff I can actually critique about, was uh, Dan Hermanson. His credits are he's active from 1998 to present. 22 art director credits, did eight episodes of a series of unfortunate events. He did all of the episodes of the 2008 miniseries The Andromeda Strain. That was <clears throat> a uh, later adaptation of the Robert Wise film The Andromeda Strain. I preferred the Robert Wise version. However, I've seen them both. 2008 one isn't bad. It's an updating. He has five production designer credits, and he lists two episodes of Superman and Lois for this and ten episodes of Supernatural, and he has 14 art department credits, no awards. Um, I found his uh, production design real good. Um, He is being kind to small towns. It would be very easy to make it look hicky and stupid. And he hasn't done that. He's captured what a, what a decent small town with a decent community in it you know, looks like. Or maybe one that's starting to lose people, what it looks like. I think that's very good. You go to the you know, Smallville, it looks very, very similar to the downtown area of many small towns that I've been to in the Midwest and ones I've lived in. Um, great. Awesome. Uh, I find the, uh, the direction, the, the, the uh, production design of the Kent Farm and its surroundings Ever since 1978, no production designer has ever strayed very far from this. Um, You know, you can't see it very well because of where this is. Let me pull this over to the other side real quick. Oops. No production designer has ever strayed very far from what you see back here. You got the house. You got the barn. There's a road leading from it to the main road. No production designer has ever strayed very far from that. It's very similar. No problem with that at all. Uh, Because that, again, it reminds me very much of what uh, I really experienced when I was spending time at my grandparents' cattle ranch. One thing, as I mentioned, Kansas is not a dairy state. If you want to go to dairy, go to Minnesota, go to Wisconsin, someplace like that. It is a plains state. It's like this. It's flat. Uh, Farmers grow grains, ranchers ranch cattle. Uh, And again, the dairy farm barn is not even remotely accurate. Um, Those don't look like that anymore. That's that's a small one. If if people are really dairy farming, that's what they're doing. It's a huge barn with 
a hundred milking stations, lots of concrete, and a very large vat that the milk goes into. Really big. This is no longer subsistence level farming, guys. This is t scientific farming. If you want to know about it, contact me, SYLRanch.tv. Um, modern agriculture uses a lot of dedicated heavy equipment and rarely ever ever uses equipment that can, you can find in a barn and attached to a tractor. Please Google this. Contact me. I will tell you all about it. Otherwise, production design was great. Interior of the Kent home, again, they haven't really strayed very much in terms of the way that looks since 2008. But that's okay because I go out there today, I can see the same things. That's fine. It's realistic. Music is by uh, Dan Romer. His credits are, he was active. I didn't catch it. I missed putting it up. Uh, he has 40 composer credits. He's going to be, be doing the music for all 15 episodes of this first block that have been ordered for Superman and Lois. He's done 51 episodes of The Good Doctor, 28 episodes of Atypical, and has 11 music department credits. He has won awards. In 2012, he won the uh, uh, Awards Circuit Community Awards for Best Original Score for sorry about this, the Beasts of the Southern Wild won the Los Angeles Film Critics Association Award, Best Music for Beasts of the Southern Wild. 2013, he won the Alliance of Women Film uh, Journalists Best Filmer Score Award for Beasts of the Southern Wild. He also won the World Soundtrack Award, Discovery of the Year Award for Beasts of the Southern Wild. Won the Georgia Film Critics Association Best Original Score Award for Beasts of the Southern Wild. Won the International Online Cinema Awards to Best Original Score for Beasts of the Southern Wild. In 2015, he won the Hollywood Music and Media Awards Best Original Score Feature Film for Beasts of the Southern Wild. And in 2017, we broke away from that. He won the Ghent International Film Festival Award Best Music for a, uh, a, uh, Asaramba. He also won the International Documentary Association Best Music Award for Brimstone and Glory. His music here is uh, fine. Uh, there is nothing here that jumps out at me. It's not John Williams stuff where it's like, wow, uh, what incredible music. It's good for what it does. It's fine. I have no problems with it. There's nothing in here that I, I say this is maestro level stuff. But again, I, what I really tend to watch for is two things. Is it maestro level or is it something that's just wrong? Neither of these. The music is fine. No problem. Special effects coordinator is Dan Sedlak. Uh, however, he's leading a team in IMDb. It's impossible to make an idea what the uh, general special effects were. Uh, special effects here are fine. It's not like Batwoman, where the special effects look like they're done at Dolby After Effects, and they're terrible. Special visual effects coordinator... Uh, and special visual effects, rather, are provided by Zoic Studios. Impossible to know who's responsible for what. And again, uh, special effects, special visual effects, they're all good. There's nothing here that takes you out of the moment. There's nothing that looks bad like everything on Batwoman. Costume designer is Katrina McCarthy. She uh, has 48 costume designer credits, 13 episodes. She's going to be doing of Superman and Lois. Did 26 episodes. 26 episodes of a little, uh, million little things, 10 episodes of uh, the 2018 uh, series The X-Files, the 2018 version, and has 11 costume and wardrobe credits with no awards. The costumes here are fine. Again, I have to caution against using too much flannel. People in rural areas don't dress any differently than people in uh, metro areas. They don't. It's all the same. They get the clothes from the same places. Um, use regular clothes. And just, you know, it's a, it, was, it was a little much. Scale it back. It's not horrible. Just scale it back. <clears throat> the Superman costume is clearly a muscle suit. And it's bad. It looks bad. Um, <clears throat> Tyler Hoechlin, Hoechlin is obviously in a muscle suit when he's Superman. He looks significantly too large for his civilian clothes, and the muscle suit looks fake. This is probably in response to criticism that he got when he was in the Arrowverse, particularly in Crisis on Infinite Earths, when he was being compared to Tom Welling and Brandon Routh, who are both muscular, appropriately muscular for Superman. He looks small by comparison. Now you could get away with a muscle suit in The Adventures of Superman in the 1950s when you had crappy, low-def, analog broadcast television. But you can't do that in 1080p when we're bordering on 4K. 
either put Hecklin on Chris Reeves' bodybuilding regime or just lose that muscle suit. It looks terrible. And if you want to put him on his bodybuilding machine, I have links in my description box below to three different videos where he where they go over the Superman bodybuilding uh, regime. So do that. Guys, I'm sorry. Put the trunks back on Superman's costume. I know some people think it looks weird, but frankly, Superman does not look like Superman without the trunks. Put them back. Luthor's armor suit looks plastic. That may be part of the visual effects. I don't know. But it's bad. Do something about that. And again, don't use as much flannel in Kansas in Smallville scenes. Uh, otherwise, I thought the costumes were fine. There was no problem with the costumes. They looked perfectly natural uh, for the people wearing them. Again, not so much flannel, guys. The uh, Getting close to the end here. The key makeup artist is Trisha Porter. Uh, her, act, her credits are she's active 2004 to present, has 20 makeup credits, and uh, has, uh, among others, 141 episodes of Supergirl and has won no, won no awards. Okay. And two things. <clears throat> Superman Clark Kent's stubble. Get rid of it. It looks dumb. I'm sorry, Superman shaves, period. I don't even know. I, I guess that it's, like, fashionable for men now, maybe. I've never understood it. I didn't understand it in the 80s. I don't even understand how you get it. I mean, me, I'm doing work here to get my beard to come out the way it is. If I wanted to get a stubble, I don't know what I would do. I don't think my beard trimmer goes low enough to get an actual stubble. I don't know why anybody does that, and certainly it's out of character for Superman. Lose it. He's clean-shaven, period. And then there are the character ages. Um, we see at the beginning of this Superman, who typically in the comics is portrayed as perennially 28 or 29 years old. And when he comes to Metropolis, that's about how old he is. He's in his 20s. He doesn't look like he's in his 20s. When he meets Lois Lane, he looks like he's in his 30s or his 40s. So does she. And now we've got this show that's 15 years later, and they're talking about how he isn't aging, but Lois is, and neither of them look like they have changed at all from when we first saw them. You should have done some de-aging. If you're going to take them back in time to when they first were made, and you only have like a, one quarter of a scene, like 20, 25, 30 seconds of that, just, just de-age them. Take away the wrinkles. You know, they do it all the time. Tom Hanks is looking young when he's old. So um, <clears throat> that's the base, base of the review here. EA took about an hour, or 50 minutes or so. You have just seen one of my more long-form reviews, but it was worth it because this is a good show. We ask at the end, is it any good? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, you should watch this show for the first time since 1978. They are finally getting Superman right. This is a great show so far. This is an awesome episode. You should definitely watch this show. Turn off Batwoman. Let the ratings go into the tank. Let them have a third season, even though nobody's watching. Don't watch it. I'm stopping, because I got something good to watch. This one. My scale is much higher. Batwoman. It was one is existentially bad. You could die from watching it, with five being just barely passable. This one, I would give... My scale is one is passable and five is Hugo Award worthy. Not the Emmys. Frack the Emmys. They don't matter. The Hugo Award is the one that I care about. Now, because of that, I give this episode a four. It's not going to win any Hugos, but it's a damned fine episode. It is the best live action Superman um, put to the large or small screen since Donner's 1978 Superman. It is absolutely the best since then. Nobody has done it very well since then. This one, they finally get it right. At least they have in this first episode. This is also the best Superman on screen uh, since um, the uh, Superman, the animated series, and the DCEU in general. That was the best Superman since the Donner movies. Um, this is not as good as that. But it is really good. For live action, it is the best. Superman and Lois isn't as good as the DCEU, but it is really, really good. With that, I must say, I remain a bit nervous. It is still possible to frack this up all the way as the other Arrowverse shows have been fracked up, particularly considering that the producers and some of the people involved have been fracking up the Arrowverse shows for years. But I am 
given what we saw tonight and the fact that we are not falling into this rather formulaic, uh, you got the hero and the the uh, you know the supporting characters circling around them who are the brains behind the outfit and all that. That's not happening here. This is a totally different dynamic. We're looking at a family drama show, really, with the superpowers and supervillains thrown in. Awesome. I am on board for this. I am cautiously optimistic. Great show. Watch it. Do not watch Batwoman anymore. I'm so glad to have that monkey off my back. I had a, uh, an alarm that was telling me, you know, oh, God, it's an hour to Batwoman. And I'd be like, oh, no. This one. I'll have an alarm that says it's an hour to Superman and Lois. I'll be, yes, I'm all ready. I'm waiting to go. Awesome. Great. Perfect. Wonderful, wonderful show so far. Do watch it. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.